Hi, and welcome to our webinar this afternoon. On behalf of all of us at Texas Oncology Foundation, thank you for joining. With the COVID-19 officially declared a pandemic, our daily routines have been completely affected. Every aspect of our lives, from the social and physical to the emotional and economic, are being impacted. Cancer patients and their loved ones know all too well about adapting, and our goal during this unprecedented global challenge is to continue to provide the skills and resources necessary to maintain healthy survivorship. In this webinar series, we're going to hear from Nicole Hodak. She's a board-certified oncology dietitian at Baylor Salmons in Dallas, and she's a regular on the Survive and Thrive circuit. So she's going to talk to us about nutrition during um, this pandemic, and um, She's going to give us tips while we're sheltered in place. So, Nicole, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. So, when first offered this opportunity to talk about nutrition um, in regards to COVID-19, I think I first thought was, my first thought was how or what does nutrition really have to do with the virus per se? And when I moved beyond that and really started, moved a couple of days into it, that's when I really started to realize that this was more than just a toilet paper shortage and that it was starting to become something that was going to impact each and every day of our lives in regards to three main things, food safety, the supply shortages in regards to food, and then our nutrition for health. Because that's what I get asked a lot about is how, or at least I hear people talking about it, how can I um, bolster my nutrition for immune health and that sort of thing. So we'll cover each of those. So when it comes to food safety, you're likely aware that COVID-19 is a virus and it's not a foodborne illness. So it's not the food safety um, that's directly related to COVID-19 that we're concerned about. But what we are concerned about is the fact that we have um, we have greater risks when we're on a food shortage and we're trying to extend the, the shelf stable or the non-perishable aspect of our foods. So that's where we really want to bring this to the forefront and start talking about what food safety looks like and just remind everyone. The other piece of this is that when someone does encounter something like a foodborne illness, um, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea are part of that picture. And if someone gets dehydrated and needs a clinic visit or IV fluids, those are not scenarios that we want to run into right now because we want our patients to stay home and be safe. So first and foremost, as you've likely heard by now, especially from the, um, the CDC, clean hands are of great importance. And that's not just for food safety, but that, that is actually for um, you know, spread prevention. So clean hands, we're talking about washing with warm water, washing our hands for 20 seconds, that's happy birthday twice, that's the ABCs once, and then rinsing, that's, that's really important here. And then clean surfaces, so making sure that um, the things that we're touching are clean, including our countertops, clean dishes, all of that is gonna prevent the spread of, of foodborne pathogens as well as, as the virus. When it comes to storage, this is big here. When we're talking about having shortages, and this is kind of what I was mentioning earlier, we're, we're thinking about how can we store things and keep them safe? If we wanna keep our hot foods hot and we wanna keep our cold foods cold, and there's, a, there's what we call a temperature danger zone. That's 40 degrees to 140 degrees. Anything on the, um, on the interior of that, in that window, that's where pathogens are thriving and multiplying at a greater rate. And that's definitely what we don't want. So once foods are prepared, you have about a two hour window. We wanna make sure that we get that into some sort of preservation, typically your freezer or in your refrigerator. Um, when you are storing those items in your refrigerators or your freezers, we wanna make sure that we're keeping things separate. So prepared foods should maybe be on their own shelf or at least separate from your raw items. You wouldn't want to put eggs or even meat on top of a prepared dish. So that's how we prevent cross-contamination there. And then expiration dates. This is kind of interesting. Um, this is a great resource here, but we tend to, um, especially recently, because they're, we're trying to make things last longer, we are maybe um, giving a little bit of, of, a, of a, a larger window than what's on those items as far as an expiration date. And the Food Keeper app is a really good resource to kind of go to for that. So for example, if we're talking about something like milk, 
you might get an extra day or two on that item. Same thing with eggs. And but I would tell you to use extra, extra caution with that. Um, you know, you can do that when you're in a short supply, but you want to make sure that you're using your best judgment here. Because if it smells off or it, it has a different texture, you notice a different texture to it, you definitely want to make sure that you're discarding those items. I'll tell you, um, when recently for myself, I bought a family pack of chicken and I've kind of been prioritizing how we're cooking and preparing things in the home. And my chicken had an expiration date of which I was up against. I wasn't beyond it, but I could tell you that that chicken had a bad odor to it, a really bad odor to it. And so that date was not incorrect. So definitely use your best judgment on both sides of that spectrum. But the Food Keeper app is really, really useful, especially when you're maybe preparing items and you're trying to decide just how long you can kind of keep that in the home and the refrigerator and the pantry. Um, you know, for example, and you just, you'll search through it. Um, you'll search through for your items. So for example, if we're talking about something like um, bread that's been pre-sliced and pre-packaged, you typically get five to seven days on that product. And when you're shopping, let's say once every 14 days or even longer durations, that's obviously not gonna get you to the end of, of your time frame. But what we know is that if you put it in your freezer, let's say you could actually get something closer to three months out of that bread. And so that's, that's a really good opportunity to know that that's something you can do if you go to the grocery store and you see maybe two loaves, you can get an extra one and put it in your freezer and it'll actually keep a little bit longer for you. So that's the, that's the Food Keeper app and that's from foodsafety.gov. When we did our meal planning, um, you know, session recently, I, one of the things in that session and in all the sessions, I'll always talk about building from what you have on hand. So now is the time to use what is in your freezer. So start there. Cause a lot of times we put things in there and we just don't quite get to them in time. Hopefully you've dated them cause there is a, um, you know, a life of how long you could keep items in the freezer. Typically it's six months for something that you've prepared. That's generally a good rule of thumb. Um, but we want to start pulling those items out. Use what you have, um, definitely cook or eat what you already have. So try to do things, we call it FIFO in nutrition or in food service, and that means first in, first out. So check your expiration dates, be really strategic in how you're preparing your meals, planning your meals, and actually consuming them. Um, so use the items that you have in your freezer and then leftover ingredients. So if you have something left over from a meal or a menu that you've prepared, you know, take those, um, take those components that are left over. Salads and soups are a great place to put them. Um, you could also freeze those items. So if you have a little bit of leftover carrots or broccoli or Brussels sprouts, what ha whatever it is, um, you'll want to take those items. You can blanch them, which means you just um, put them in hot boiling water very quickly and you um, bring them up to their brightest color and then drop them into an ice bath right after that. And then you can put those in the freezer. So that's a good way to kind of keep making use of, of the leftovers that you have. And then plan with flexibility. So by now you've probably realized that um, many, many, many items are out on the shelves. And so you may go to the grocery store with the plan to make one dish and you may have found that your whole, um, you know, that menu has just been wiped away because you don't have an ingredient that, that it is built upon. So plan with flexibility, things like soups, stews, um, one pot or one pan meals um, will allow a lot of flexibility so that you can make appropriate substitutions. So you want to do that and then planning for ripening. So again, just like the bread I was talking about earlier, when it comes to your produce, if there are things that typically um, would ripen out um, on shelves or outside of your refrigerator, you know, maybe you put some of it in. So half of it in your refrigerator and half of it out. So for example, if I bought a bag of oranges or apples, you might consider doing that to where you're letting some of it ripen while you're keeping some of it preserved a little bit in the refrigerator. Um, peaches are a good example of that. Pears are a good example of that. Um, bananas are another thing you can do if you, um, you know, maybe you're kind of, you've already made banana bread with the ones that have ripened, but you still have bananas left, put them in the freezer because you can make them later. You can make a smoothie out of it later. Those are the kinds of things you'll want to do. And this is um, a list of items and ingredients that I would tell you when you're putting things in your home. I hope I'm not too late with this. It just depends on your local availability of foods. But 
when you're looking at what you want to put in the home or what you want to keep in the home, if you encounter some of these items, I would put them in your home because they are really buildable. And what I mean by that is you can take um, a lot of these items and make something else with it. So in your canned goods down here under vegetables and fruit, for example, you know, buying tomato sauce, um, you know, buying um, diced tomatoes. These are the things that you can kind of turn into other things like a marinara or maybe a, a type of soup or a stew. Um, when it comes to, you know, using flour and milk, you can make sauces, you can make roux, you can make um, breads. I mean, you can, you can build upon these items. And don't be afraid to do substitutions either. So those are kind of your pantry goods. I would start definitely with your non-perishables as you can find them um, because they are gonna last longer than the things that you put in your refrigerator, especially. But here are some really um, useful substitutions. So where you get to the store and you don't have something, take a quick second. I think it's, you know, I found myself going to look for, let's say, all-purpose flour at a, at a local market of mine. And when I got there, I saw that they didn't have any. My initial thought was, ah, what am I going to do? But then I realized that there are a whole bunch of other flowers that are on there, and I probably have a couple of cups of flour left at home. And so what I realized is that you can do substitutions that way. So I could use maybe a little bit of that all-purpose flour, but make it um, but extend it a little bit by using a whole wheat flour or a bread flour and kind of doing a different ratio with it. The texture might be a little bit different in what the end result is. However, it's a really good kind of workaround. So that's that's the kind of thinking here. If you don't have eggs, go and look and see if they have um, powdered eggs. The same is true of milk. You know, you might find um, powdered milk that you can reconstitute with water. If they don't have garlic and onion, consider your spices like dried garlic powder or onion powder. If you need cooking wine, use fruit juices. Uh, Greek yogurt is a really great base for things. You can use it for sauces um, to replace things like mayo or sour cream. If you like yogurt in general, you could then um, flavor it yourself with a type of fruit or something of that nature, a granola. So just the idea is, to, again, to always be building upon other things, but don't forget the substitutions where things work for for other things. Applesauce is another good example. You can totally replace oil with applesauce if you can find it. Um, mushrooms are really great in place of, of ground beef in some recipes. So there's a whole host of different things you can kind of work around and work, work with. And as I mentioned earlier, probably one of the bigger questions that I often get asked is, what can I be doing with my nutrition? So how should I be building my nutrition for better health? And the truth of the answer is, is we really just want you to keep focusing on, and I talk about this on the next slide, but what the cornerstones of nutrition are, and that's really focusing still on our plants, right? So, and just getting our nutrients from food as opposed to getting them from supplements. That will always, always, always be true. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll see someone that gets sick and then they're taking their emergency from a vitamin C source to try and get better. Um, the reality is, is we know that we, we see in the literature that that actually doesn't have any bearing on that. Zinc is one of those nutrients um, that you can actually see maybe, uh, you know, 12 hour or 24 hour reduction in something like a cold that it actually can have a benefit. But in all, we definitely just see that having good nutrition kind of going into these types of things is a better place to be. The only thing I will say on this list from a supplement standpoint that might be worth looking into, and by looking into, I mean just talking to your providers and seeing if that's something that um, they think is, is feasible for you, is a vitamin D supplement. There's a pretty substantial body of evidence to suggest that um, you know, vitamin D deficiency in particular um, can be attributable to a higher risk of respiratory infections. And I think when we're talking about COVID-19, that's something, something that if we can prevent it with a vitamin D supplement that we definitely should be considering. So talk to your providers about whether they feel that that's an appropriate supplement for you. And if they do, um, I always go back to the selection of the supplement that you pick. So make sure that You've checked it either on Labdoor, so you're looking at something that's independently reviewed and that it is, um, it does have the quality and the purity standards that, that you would want in your supplement. Otherwise, you could just look for that USP seal that's often found on some of your supplements. So here's that, 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 those cornerstones that I was talking about earlier. So having those 
plants as much as you can find them, whether it's canned, whether it's frozen, whether it's fresh, um, your vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, beans, fruit, we still want those to be the cornerstones of what we're doing here. So that's really where we want that balance in our diet. Um, you know, less processed, less added sugar. I think meat is probably pretty hard to find in a lot of stores. I've seen it in some in abundance and not at all in others. And that's, um, you know, meat definitely has its place in our diet as far as finding balance. But it also, I think right now, is probably encouraging people to kind of get outside of their comfort zone of eating maybe some more plant-based meals and foods, which is a good thing. And then get moving. Uh, moving is often attributed to weight control or weight um, weight management, but physical activity does so much more for us than just that. It is um, massively supportive of things like our our immune function and also our mental health. And right now, I think we know that the stressors of COVID-19 by themselves, not to mention just dealing with the other stressors that come along with being a survivor in general. Um, getting moving is one of those things that can really help our mental health. It can also offer a distraction. One thing I do want to mention is that we are seeing or where we're talking about more are how people manage their stressors when it comes to eating and um, what they do in, in response to that. And th there's two ends of the spectrum. And one of them is that some people find themselves eating more or binging or just grazing all day as a coping me mechanism for the stress with this, this pandemic. And then we have those other individuals that just totally shut down on their appetite and they find themselves in a very restrictive state. And so what we're really asking people to do is definitely to focus on their mental health here, right? Identify what their stressors are, try and step back, try and focus on the controllables. Um, if social media and the news outlets are driving some of, um, are, are kind of some of those triggers for this type of eating behavior or the stressors in, in general, we definitely wanna take the opportunity to kind of step back. And that's kind of where this get moving piece comes back into play. So getting physically active, getting getting moving, all these things really definitely just help with our general mental health and our overall well being. And I also just wanna mention that comfort foods serve a real purpose. They're comfort foods for a reason, um, only so long as we don't carry a guilt or a burden on the back end. So certainly allow ourselves to kind of loosen the reins a little bit um, when it comes to our nutrition, definitely making sure we're get, maintaining a balanced diet, that we're getting new, new, good nutrition. But if there are some aspects that we can't control and food is, is providing um, kind of a source of comfort, so long as it's not providing a guilt on the back end, it is a good thing and it absolutely has a place here. And then this last slide I have for you all are those resources that I've mentioned earlier. So the CDC, you've likely heard of them. If you haven't um, before now, you definitely have. They are kind of the front lines of information on good hand washing, sanitizing, um, how we can be sanitizing in the shortage of, of soaps and sanitizers in general. So they have some good guidelines there. Eatright.org. That is the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, and they have a lot of really good information on how we can do things to kind of come around um, the challenges that we're facing. I think one of the big things, back to that kind of mental health piece that I mentioned earlier, is that especially where we have, um, you know, older adults and grandchildren, and they're not able to um, kind of see or, or be present with their family like they typically would or share meals together, that's where technology can be really helpful. So bringing in things like Zoom or FaceTime um, or, or Skype to have those interactions is really, really important. And, and eatright.org is, is a good place to kind of get ideas like that. Foodsafety.gov, that's where that Food Keeper app that I mentioned earlier is. That's the link there. FeedingAmerica.org is an organization um, for food pantries and um, food, food as a resource for those that are, are struggling to find that. So there's definitely a lot more emergency funds being, putting, being put into these avenues. And so I would use this website as a resource if you're looking for a food pantry for yourself or for someone that you love if you're running into a food shortage. And then that last link there is just um, some of those ratios on food substitutions that I mentioned earlier. 
So I hope, you know, with today's webinar that you all will continue to practice good nutrition in general and definitely try to have fun and step out of the box a little bit more than, than we typically would, but, but most importantly, stay safe. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nicole. Yeah. Um, um, there's Natalie. I, oh, can you hear me okay? Yes, um, you're back on. Nicole, your presentation, excellent as always. Um, you are a regular for Survive and Thrive uh, webinars and symposiums, and so uh, you never disappoint, and we always learn something new. I do have a question about um, planning meals. I think that that's where it can be just a little bit overwhelming when you think about, I think we're finding that we're cooking more, right? Because we're home more. So mm -hmm. is there any website or an app that you would suggest to help people plan their meals? And um, in addition to that, is there an app that you know of where you can put in different ingredients that you have and then there's ideas for what to cook? Absolutely. Um, so I tend to be a big fan of something called Recipe Keeper. Um, it's a it's a great resource in which that if you have if you're using kind of a smartphone you can actually just um, kind of click your share button and it'll dump that recipe in a very nice format into that into that app um, and it'll allow you then to kind of pull those recipes into your you know your grocery list you can add them to a calendar that kind of thing of course with our most recent symposium there's also a really good um, I would say, because I made it right, but um, <laughs> we did a good kind of like handout aspect of how you can kind of uh, streamline your thinking when it comes to actually planning your meals. It's kind of funny, we did that um, recently and I, it's just, it, it feels like everything's kind of been turned on its head because you can kind of get to the grocery store and feel a little bit defeated. But, but again, as I was mentioning earlier, planning with flexibility in mind now is more important than ever. So you're one pot meals, your one pan meals, your stews, your pastas, those are gonna be um, be really easy to kind of accommodate and modify. Well, thanks. Um, you know, I always think you're so thorough on these sites, so I, I on these uh, webinars, so I don't know that I have very many questions left to ask you, but I don't wanna put you on the spot too much, but I would like to know, is there a favorite recipe that you've cooked uh, during your quarantine time? Um, you know, I've been, been really makeshift. So I actually probably would say chili has been, <laughs> we made a really good chili the other night and my husband was like, this is a 10 out of 10. And I was like, what have I been doing all this time? Like, um, <laughs> to make a chili, like really wow you, I don't know, but, um, yeah. And, you know, just, you know, last night I surprised myself with pulling things out of the fridge, like I was talking about. So we had some leftover you know, like diced chili ready tomatoes. And I threw it in the tacos last night because I had like a cup portion left over. So that's kind of been the fun part of getting a little bit thrifty and also just um, creative with, with what's been done. So yeah. It is, it's a, it's a creative outlet, right? Yeah. That, that's the mindset we have to have, so it's exciting. Well, listen, thank you again for joining us. Um, to those of you who listen to this webinar, we're just very thankful that you would take the time to uh, listen to this resource. You know, our goal at the Texas Oncology Foundation is to continue to support cancer patients and these webinar series um, that we will provide throughout the pandemic. Um, we'll, we'll provide the usual information um, that we would like to give you to help maintain healthy survivorship. So, Thank you for participating. Kelly, are, are there any um, things that you would like to cover? Yeah, I just wanna reiterate, we are continuing um, this webinar series, uh, Cancer Amid COVID-19, Navigating Your Wellness Among a Pandemic. And so I just encourage you all to continue to follow us on Facebook and we are going to continue um, posting additional presentations and resources there. Thank you again, Nicole, I appreciate your time. Yeah, you're so welcome. Thanks for having me.